Yeah, let me let me just go over to to what's going on in the news today. There's some 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 scientists might have embedded their their work that's concerned about Unit Four collapsing because they they're damming up or stopping the flow of groundwater to the uh, you know, and they're trying to get it to uh, stop this causing uh, uh, pooling of water and subsidence of the structure. Let me go back to an article I really quickly <laughs> that, that I wrote a while ago. You don't have to collapse Unit 4 to drain it dry. All you got to do is make it move a little bit so that the seal around the reactor cavity flange, which is called the refueling seal, breaks. That's the only thing holding up all the water in the spent fuel pool. That sounds like bad, bad news, right? It's very bad news because you won't have access to anywhere in the plant at all. You couldn't get anywhere close to it. That's very bad. TEPCO President Naomi Hirose apologized for the problems at a session of the Fukushima Prefectural Assembly. He said the firm will make wastewater decontamination its top priority. This is the second time that a TEPCO president has attended a session of the assembly since the nuclear accident at the plant in 2011. TEPCO is dealing with the situation and starting to take measures with determination to deploy all of our management resources. Hirose has also pledged that decommissioning the reactors at the plant will proceed without delay. We have announced that we will put aside another $10 billion for this purpose for the next 10 years. He stressed that he will ensure that no necessary measures are canceled or delayed just because the company wants to cut costs or streamline its business. If you've gone crazy or something, I mean, if you've, if you, if you've gone crazy or depressed, I'm, I'm just saying. That's something I need to know about, okay? I mean, that, that affects me. The operator of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant says a rubber mat has come loose in a tank of a new filtration system. This may be clogging the drain outlet. Tokyo Electric Power Company suspended a test run of the advanced liquid processing system on Friday after having resumed operation earlier in the day for the first time in one and a half months. The system is designed to eliminate radioactive materials from the water that is accumulating at the plant. TEPCO had detected a decline in the flow of radioactive wastewater in a pipe that carries the water to a storage tank. The rubber mat is used to protect the floor of the tank when carrying out inspections with a ladder. The utility will check other tanks for similar problems before resuming the test run. The operators of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant have resumed the operation of a system used to filter radioactive materials from water. It says human error caused the suspension last week. Workers at Tokyo Electric Power Company on Monday resumed their test run of the Advanced Liquid Processing System, or ALPS. The system is designed to eliminate radioactive materials from the water that is accumulating at the plant. They suspended operations on Friday. They had just resumed it for the first time in a month and a half. The workers detected a reduction in the flow of contaminated water in a pipe that sends water to a storage tank. TEPCO officials said a loose rubber mat clogged the drain. They say workers forgot to remove it after inspecting the inside of the tank. They had used the mat under a ladder during the inspection. The plant's officials have been placed with problems using the Alps. They found a water leak in June caused by corrosion. The operator of the Monju prototype reactor says it has completed safety checks it had failed to perform. Monju is a fast breeder reactor located on the Sea of Japan coast. The Japan Atomic Energy Agency told nuclear regulators they had finished checking 14,000 pieces of equipment at Monju. The operator had been blamed for more than 12,000 missed safety checks. In May, regulators ordered the suspension of preparations to restart the reactor. Now, the Japan Atomic Energy Agency later discovered that it had failed to check another 2,000 pieces of equipment. The Monju reactor uses plutonium extracted from spent nuclear fuel to generate power. 
It was turned on in 1994, but a sodium coolant leak in 1995 resulted in a suspension of operations for more than 14 years. The reactor was restarted in May 2010 and shut down once again in October of that year after a fuel exchange device fell into the reactor. Last week, the science ministry decided to continue running Monju for at least another six years. that you could build a thriving economy based on uh, nuclear power and related businesses, that dream no longer uh, can be a reality. And the faster you can come to grips with this new reality is better. Japan aims to double its exports of food and farm produce to more than $10 billion by the year 2020. But a survey says less than 2% of the country's farmers currently export. The government-funded Japan Finance Corporation surveyed its client farmers and farming corporations in July. Around 7,000 responded. About a third said they were interested in exporting their produce, but only 1.7% said they were exporting. Another 1% said they planned to. Analysts say Japanese farmers lack know-how on export procedures and the ability to find retailers abroad. They also say production costs are higher than large-scale farms overseas. In part one of this report, we looked at the danger of catastrophic failures, not only from nuclear reactors, but from spent fuel pools. Tonight, we're going to look at the end-of-life issues with nuclear power, storage, decommissioning of power plants. This is the most delicate part of the whole operation, as it involves reopening the building without contaminating the area or staff on the outside. Not including the reactor building would generate 30,500 tons of waste in need of special treatment. But the figures remain questionable. The OECD cites 36,000 tons for the total shutdown of a power plant. Up until now, no site has been entirely dismantled. Depending on the method chosen, the process can take between 25 and 100 years. Plants are just now starting to be shut down after about 40 years of operation. But others are having their licenses extended with little or no public examination. Sharon Harris near Raleigh, North Carolina, has just had its license extended in spite of signs of aging and many troubles at that location. Between 1999 and 2003, there were 12 major problems requiring the shutdown of the plant. That's an average of once every four months, as opposed to the industry average of once every 18 months. Four and a half times the shutdowns as the industry average. In May of this year, the plant was shut down by the NRC for a couple of weeks when a quarter-inch crack was found inside the reactor pressure vessel head. In August, an explosion of electrical equipment caused the plant to be shut down. One week later, the same nuclear power plant was found to have a leaking valve that had released at least 10,000 gallons of radioactive water. But in spite of that history, Sharon Harris asked for and got a 20-year extension. That means that it has a license to run for 60 years. No nuclear power plant has done that. We're dealing with really old reactors, and they have to be decommissioned. If we were to follow the advice of the former chair of the NRC and shut down all the nuclear reactors, we would still have a legacy of dangerous materials from the decommissioned plants and spent fuel that threatens life on Earth. Catastrophic reactor failure during operation, radiation leaks during operation, catastrophic spent fuel fires, and pushing the storage of dangerous wastes onto future generations for centuries or millennia. Yet, Obama wants to shut down all coal plants and go nuclear. In the next installment, we'll look at the global warming narrative and Obama's love affair with nuclear. Authorities in Sendai City say they have finished cleaning up the inflammable debris from the earthquake and tsunami that hit northeastern Japan in March 2011. The task was completed ahead of schedule. Workers used heavy machinery to throw the last 50 tons of rubble into the flames in Wakabayashi Ward. The official in charge of the project presented letters of appreciation to the operators of a temporary incinerator. Officials initially planned to treat 210,000 tons of debris from Sendai and additional waste from neighboring Ishinomaki City before the end of the year. But the project was carried out more quickly than expected because an incinerator in Ishinomaki improved its disposal capacity. Moria Endo is in charge of disaster waste disposal in Sendai. He says the city's residents have been waiting for this day for a long time. 
The city of Sendai has made another important step in the recovery process. The city government plans to complete its disposal projects by the end of the year. What's the worst that could happen When you get out there and try You know your life suddenly just Try, you can fail. You gotta gamble, you gotta take chances. Oh, don't spend your whole life chasing that white whale. Don't spend your whole life. What's the worst that could happen? What's the very, very worst? In order for the worst.
Survivors of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki still carry the scars 68 years later. Some people are suffering with illnesses they haven't had before. They're offering to help out researchers who are interested in what they're going through. Doctors at Hiroshima University Hospital are seeing something new. A rising number of patients with a rare disease caused by radiation. Chiemi Takeshima is one of them. She was four years old when the atom bomb hit her hometown of Hiroshima. Four months ago, a test revealed an abnormality in her blood. These are her blood cells. The purple spots are white blood cells that have become cancerous. Takeshima has myodysplastic syndrome, or MDS. It is known as the second leukemia. There is no cure. We believe this is because of atomic bomb radiation in Hiroshima. Last time I came here, I had no reason to cry. Who could expect something like this? <laughs> Each year, Hiroshima University Hospital finds MDS in more than 10 bomb survivors. 68 years ago, atom bomb radiation pierced people's cells. It penetrated the genes that are blueprints for the body. It's believed the damaged genes after decades cause cancer. However, no large-scale genetic data has been available to help scientists understand. One reason is what happened to many bomb victims after the war. The radiation study centers set up by the U.S. in Hiroshima and Nagasaki were not for treatment. Bomb victims who hoped their suffering would be eased found their consultations were only for the collection of data. They started to feel like guinea pigs. It took decades for this resentment to pass. Takako Yoshida died of MDS five years ago, two years after her diagnosis. Before she passed away, she offered her genes for medical research. She also decided to speak publicly about her experience. The atomic bomb has been nesting in my body for 61 years. I was shocked when it came to the surface. The horror of nuclear weapons knows no end. To honor Yoshida, a group in Nagasaki launched a drive to collect genes from bomb victims. On this day, a researcher at Nagasaki University meets with a bomb survivor who is due to have surgery for colon cancer. I hope some of what is removed tomorrow can be used for research. I'm happy to help in any way. The next day, his genes were taken from his cancerous tissue and frozen. So far, around 400 bomb survivors have joined the program. The data brings scientists closer to grasping the genetic mutations common to atom bomb survivors. I believe this shows that the bomb victims understand our research and want us to find out more about radiation's harmful effect on the human body. Chiemi Takeshima is now donating her bone marrow cells for study. Like other bomb survivors, she is hoping this benefits others in the future. An Iranian diplomat is getting ready for more talks with the international nuclear watchdog. He spoke with an international atomic energy agency representative for the first time since President Rouhani took office last month. And he agreed to meet again next month for a more comprehensive discussion. Iran's envoy to the IAEA, Reza Najafi, met with the agency's deputy director general and head of safeguards, Herman Nakats. We had uh, constructive uh, discussions uh, on the different issues and we agreed to meet again on the 28th of October. 
Analysts say the talks next month will pave the way for inspectors to visit Iran's nuclear facilities. IAEA staff have repeatedly asked for access to a military facility outside Tehran. They suspect the site plays a role in produ production of nuclear weapons. A top U.S. official says North Korea should give up trying to get the six-party talks on its nuclear program restarted without any conditions. Daniel Russell is U.S. Assistant Secretary of State in charge of policies on East Asia. Russell says Pyongyang must take concrete steps toward denuclearization before the six-party talks can be resumed. The, focus po the focal point for all of our efforts must be on the end state that we seek to achieve, which is the complete and verifiable and peaceful denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, which for all um, practical purposes means of North Korea. Earlier this week, former U.S. Special Representative for North Korean Policy Stephen Bosworth met with North Korean Vice Foreign Minister Lee Yong-ho in Berlin. Bosworth held the position until 2011. Russell said the North continued to demand at the meeting that it get support while refusing to give up its nuclear program. Experts on a Japanese government panel will discuss changing the interpretation of the country's pacifist constitution. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe pledged that Japan will engage even more actively in UN security operations in a speech to the United Nations. <laughs> No single country can protect its peace and security only by its own efforts. Under the current interpretation, the Constitution allows SDF personnel only the minimum use of weapons when they participate in UN peacekeeping missions. The Constitution is also interpreted as banning the SDF from joining multinational forces that launch military actions based on UN resolutions. Panel members say Japan should cooperate more closely with the international community, given changes in the global security situation. They will consider allowing the SDF to use weapons to support troops from other countries who come under attack in peacekeeping operations. A health ministry panel is calling, uh, calling for a full investigation into the Japanese subsidiary of Swiss-based pharmaceutical giant Novartis. The panel says the company may have used false advertising to sell a drug that lowers blood pressure. The panel says the subsidiary of Novartis may have broken the law by using manipulated clinical data to promote the drug Diovan. An employee of Novartis Pharma was found to be involved in studies on the drug at several Japanese universities. The person has denied falsifying data, but the panel says the company introduced its employee and made generous donations to the universities. It concludes Novartis Pharma was probably involved in the studies. Diovan's annual sales in Japan total about $1 billion. The president of Novartis Pharma has offered a public apology. He says he feels responsible for creating an environment where data falsification could have occurred. He says his company will cooperate with the investigation.